A big thanks to the publisher for the review copy. Children of Mortar is one of those instantly captivating experiences. For me, it has the compulsiveness of an old school Diablo title with hack and slash combat and the item grabbing that made The Binding of Isaac such a wonderfully compelling game. Throw in local two player co-op and surely developer Dead Mage and publisher 11-Bit Studios have forged something special. Let's find out. Unusually for a roguelike experience, story is at the forefront of Children of Morta. In a distant land where heroes keep darkness at bay lives the Bergeson family, three generations of whom have been battling the corruption in the foothills of Mount Morta. There was only the faint whisper of something dark something hungry. Despite the grandiose scale of the world artistically, much of the story focuses on the individual tales of the six playable characters, and for the elder members, their worries as they watch their growing children want to join the fight, which runs parallel to the ever-growing threat the corruption brings to the land. His wife gave him a kiss, and his daughters Hugs were full of reason to Desperation it. and darkness drive this family on. I loved the smaller stories within the main narrative, and the way it is mixed with the runs you go on is very clever. These tales will play out during these runs, like stumbling across someone in need or rescuing a baby wolf who then becomes a member of your family. The game is so fresh in terms of its narrative. If that wasn't enough, the library in your house will gradually build as you play, revealing more of the world and adding depth to a genre that can so easily be a more shallow one. Its head. The corruption had amplified the creature's wickedness. As you'll see in the audio section, the voice narration is the glue to this world, and his performance is outstanding in every way. And as you set out to scale the mountain and defeat the corruption, it's that narrator who will be the ever-present centerpiece of a very well-presented experience. Now, I mentioned Diablo at the very beginning of the story, and I will expand that in this section. Your quest begins in the Bergeson's house, beneath which is a hidden, ancient cave system, which I nicknamed the Bat Cave. From here, you will embark on forays to meet the corruption head on in one of three initial areas and I don't want to spoil where this goes next, which in turn have three sub-levels within them and a boss fight at the end. Before doing so, you can select a player, have a friend join the game in local co-op and check the family traits you've acquired. Combat is where the vast majority of your playtime will be spent, with an evade move for every character and enemies who, whilst not the smartest, will be coming in large swathes to end you in any which way they can. In the early game, you'll only have access to the father, John, who's a warrior, who has a long sword and shield. You'll be blocking and timing return attacks, and once you've unlocked your first skill, this will allow you to call lightning down from the heavens upon your foe. The second unlockable character, and my absolute favourite, is Linda the Bard. She carries a bow and arrow which makes her perfect for playing solo, as she can keep her distance and pelt enemies from far. Each of the six playable classes feel unique in their combat, with clever gameplay mechanics to change the way you'll play them. Kevin, for example, the youngest, is an absolutely brilliant piece of character design. Bring the stealthy, swift, dual-blade wielding assassin of the family, and with each strike of the blades, he gains momentum, getting faster and faster. However, if you don't kill an enemy for a time, it's gonna gradually slow down. This meant my first run with him was a frantic slog fest of epic monster killing proportions. Whichever character you play though, you'll have to pay close attention to the stamina bar. The warrior uses this to block with his shield, while Linda will rely on stamina to allow her to backtrack while loosing those deadly arrows. Each of them levels separately, so that when you hit that level in standard fare, you can choose areas to progress in. What's less than standard are the family traits you'll gradually unlock, which allow for family-wide perks, 
granted from each individual member. It creates a desire to branch out to classes you perhaps aren't as naturally adept. Reinforcing that sentiment is the fatigue system. If you repeatedly use the same character, they'll eventually begin to fatigue degrading their starting HP until you've rested them for a few turns by using other classes. Combat abilities come in a few different varieties. The divine relics you'll find in each run are the items of Isaac. These will offer you reusable abilities triggered with the bumper button. Passive skills and abilities can also be found in runes and other items, offering a variety of modifications to your build. And then there are the weapon damage altering ones, which are temporary, but may just ignite enemies for a short time. As some of the skills and items can only be equipped one at a time though, there is a strategic element to the game. Do you go for that totem that distracts enemies or the sword from the heavens that decimates but doesn't slow down your pursuers? Boss fights are quite challenging and the initial spider took me three runs to beat, but boy was it a good feeling. When you're dead, you'll be right back to the house where you'll embark afresh. If you're in co-op and you can revive your partner, however, then this might actually be the easier way to play the game. Much like Gungeon or Isaac, each run plays out over several floors, three to be precise, with a random generation element to them. Your map works well, and as with the titles mentioned, you may come across various different rooms. Some offer a challenging mini-game, like the epic Pong of the Gods or a horde-based survival and even a memory game of sorts, while others include story segments and side quest events. The charms, runes and obelisks are not the only things you can collect. There are chests littered around the world and much like the keys in other titles, you'll instead need to collect gems to open these. The risk and reward factor comes in when you've unlocked the shopkeeper as he will sell you fantastical items for those gems should you have stored them up. Once you've reached the last area of a run, you'll usually have a golden treasure room and then the exit. But if you wish to go and grab everything in the level, they've added in a handy teleport function to get you right back to the end when you need to. It really doesn't feel like a roguelite, because of the expert way they've tied the story to everything you do. When you die, you're always treated to a cutscene that may offer some context and even sometimes a new playable character. Heartened by his courage, his father was going to teach him the ways of battle. And the constant collection of the treasure, known as Morv, means that when you die, spending that to permanently improve your whole family feels a fair and fitting reward for your efforts via the hilariously named Uncle Ben, who does the weapons, or Grandma Margaret with her Book of Raya. She's an absolute legend, to be fair. The enemy variety is a touch lacking, with each area generally consisting of several hundred of the same ones, with a few stronger dotted in here and there. It's not a huge negative, but more variety would have been appreciated. On top of all the other collectibles, the smaller events gain you souvenirs for your house. These almost act like individual stories of sorts, such as rescuing a white wolf, and they're small touches that make the whole game feel like one cohesive adventure. Gameplay is very good, it's so simple, but it really clicked with my OG Diablo instincts. Blasting those skeletons apart felt like a homecoming, and the leveling and story-driven unlocks of the characters is great. I haven't had much experience with the co-op other than with my six-year-old daughter, but I can only imagine that it's gonna add to the overall experience and gameplay. The difficulty spike on the first boss could potentially frustrate some players, but overall, it's a great game. Gameplay scores 19 out of 20. While the controls are good, it can get a touch confusing to remember which abilities are tied to which buttons. I also don't like a restriction system in co-op. I want the screen to split and allow us both freedom to move around the level. Controls overall though are great and they score 18 out of 20. Visually, Children of Mortar ranges from absolutely stunning to repetitive at times. For the most part, I love the aesthetic and animations. It excels in cutscenes and everything is surprisingly detailed. The areas each feel unique and different but also when on runs, 
they're quite limited in scope. I would have loved more huge open outdoor ones rather than the tight confines the caves and similar areas offer. You know when you can feel the walls are there, it's just a bit like that. Still, in terms of colour palette and artistic direction, Morta's almost unparalleled in its style. Ed Kelly is Children of Morta's audio. lands around the mountain. Margaret pointed to the huge crystal at the center of the den, revealing their next task. From the first moment he speaks, he gives the game an importance and gravitas that would have been impossible without him. His delivery is really quite wonderful. And of love lost. Much like the equally great Logan Cunningham, of Bastion fame. When done right, the frequent narration becomes intrinsic to the overall makeup of the experience. Performance is solid in both docked and handheld, buttery you might say. I didn't notice any issues even when many characters were on screen. Audio could have used just a touch more in-game music for my liking. during cutscenes is brilliant and for me it was a case of just wanting more which let's be honest isn't a huge criticism. Visuals score 18 out of 20 while the audio scores 18 out of 20. The game will cost you £19.79, €21.99 or $21.99 and it can be had physically. The one area I'm not as happy with the game is its total length. Don't get me wrong, it's by no means a short one. It will take you around 15 hours for a standard run and maybe 30 to 35 if you want to find absolutely everything. But when compared to the ludicrous amounts of hours I spent on the classics and when it's this fun it just feels like it needs more. Comparatively speaking though, it isn't too bad and the excellent story makes it more than worth the asking price. It's one of the easiest games I've had to write a review of in a while, just down to how much its core mechanics have clicked with me but when Isaac has easily eaten 600 hours of my life and still has content galore, I can't help but feel a little deflated about the length here. Add in that there isn't currently a new game plus or some sort of endless mode both of which would be easy implementations and it isn't quite where I'd like it to be in that regard. Still, it is a blast and it's reasonably priced. I highly recommend what is here. Value scores 16 out of 20. Children of Morta has been one of those reviews you end up longing for. The ones where you don't care how many hours it takes to finish the game, you're so invested in the characters. Combat is simple but solid, with enough depth and in terms of the items and pickups to make each run feel truly unique. I hope down the line we get the new game plus and other additions that would take it just up to that next level. For me it's an absolute must buy title and having it physically on Switch, yes please. I'm sorry guys, I know we wanted a bit of a lol after the storm of quality, but yeah, add this one onto your ever growing wish list. Thanks again to the developers and to all of you who consistently support us. It really does mean the world. For all things Switch all the time, say it with me just so we can wind Glenn up. Keep it Switch up. See ya!